Thank you, Glenn. That's Glenn Page, part of our Blue Marble Evaluation team. I'm Michael Quinn Patton, coming to you from the north woods of Minnesota, hunkered down during this pandemic crisis, and delighted today to uh, introduce Fred Carden, a longtime colleague and friend who's in Ottawa, Canada. Uh, Fred, for a number of years, was director of the evaluation unit at the International Development Research Center in Ottawa. Uh, he has done work around the world and part of what is rare and special about the expertise that Fred brings to evaluation work and development is he's done work at the grassroots level, at the, at the local level. He's worked with policymakers at national level. He's worked with international agency people across national and international lines. He's really worked at the micro and macro levels across sectors, across specializations. Um, IDRC, the International Development Research Center, works in a variety of areas. Fred was engaged in all of those areas. He was a major force in supporting outcome mapping as a global network and did a book, a very um, influential and important book on knowledge to policy, um, making the most of development by generating knowledge to turn into policy. He uh, is now running his own consultancy called Using Evidence, and he's going to share with us his thoughts today on institutional strengthening, institutions and blue marble evaluation. One of the things that IDRC under Fred's leadership in the evaluation unit did was strengthen uh, evaluation associations around the world, in Asia and Africa and Latin America. Um, he's devoted a lot of attention to institutions and institutional strengthening. So thank you, Fred, for joining this series of Blue Marble webinars, and it's all yours. Thanks very much for that introduction, Michael. I appreciate it. So as Michael said, I work globally, um, obviously a lot on video platforms like everybody else now. And we booked this, um, this session long before the pandemic was even a glimmer in anybody's eye. And I think it's even more timely because what I want to talk about is the importance of institutions and the importance of institutional strengthening, um, especially in the development space where now that the donors can't travel, the time is right to actually push them to be thinking in more and different ways about, about how they work, where they do their work, and who they work with. Um, and I think the importance of agency at the local level becomes even more, uh, more noticeable and more needed. I was recently asked by a foundation about six or eight months ago to bring together a, a team of African researchers to answer the question for that foundation on how do you actually work to strengthen research institutions in Africa? And they wanted to hear voices from the field. They wanted to hear what the researchers thought about uh, the support that they were getting from donors and the work that was being done. Um, and I think that that's a really important sustainability question. Um, strong institutions are needed. Uh, there's no, uh, it, it, countries don't have voice if they don't have strong institutions. And throughout this uh, presentation, I'll have a number of quotes on the screen. And this was one of them that one of the researchers said, how is Africa ever going to develop if it doesn't have its own set of very strong institutions? And I think the time is right to really uh, promote that question now because uh, there isn't the capacity to travel in the same ways as there was before. And I think that opens up tremendous opportunities. So how does this relate to Blue Marvel evaluation? I think it relates to a lot of the Blue Marble evaluation principles certainly in terms of transformative engagement. Uh, countries and institutions can't engage if they don't have the capacities to do so. And you can't work across silos if there isn't agency in all of the silos. Uh, lots of the other reliable principles come into play. Transboundary engagement is self-evident. Uh, skin in the game, everybody has skin in the game. So it's quite a, an important question to me. So we looked at the question of, as a starting point, of what are very strong research institutions. And we identified four things. And the first three are 
the main things that people talk about when they think about good management practices, that you have to have people, you have to have leadership that has vision uh, to drive the organization. You have to have strong technical skills in your staff to be able to do effective work. You have to have good products. You have to have high quality. In this case, research. We were looking at research institutions. Um, but I would say the lessons apply much more broadly than research institutions. But you have to have high quality products and you have to have a demand for those products. People have to want what you, what you offer. You have to have good processes. You have to have good management systems in place. You have to have good governance uh, running the institution. And the fourth element is the one that's uh, the most often ignored and that is you have to have property. You have to have the physical resources and the financial resources to deliver effectively. And I would say that in the development space that has been uh, largely ignored uh, by the donor community. So when we looked at those four Ps and we looked at them across the African research institutions, um, we asked the researchers a lot of questions and they, they gave us some very strong views. And just a sampling of them here is that the donors force research institutions to have multiple agendas. The, the donors really put their agendas uh, to the forefront and the research institutions have to adopt whatever flavor the donors have at that particular point in time. And even to the point that some of them said that the funding is actually de debilitative and, and corrosive to them. And we saw the same thing in South Asia many years ago at IDRC when we asked a, a, an evaluator to explore with a number of different organizations what had happened since they had had a positive evaluation. And what came back from a number of them was, well, actually, since that positive evaluation, we've had huge problems. And we've had problems because now all of the donors are coming to us with their agendas and we've lost track of our own agenda. Uh, we, so we're losing, we're losing direction, we're losing focus. So it's not just an African issue, it's a, it's a global issue in how research is funded. There was at least one foundation that recognized, and that's the Hewlett Foundation, this is a big challenge. And they've started to respond, uh, and they recognize that um, good organizations are financially depressed, and that they underrepresent their true costs. So there's, this, there's a fairly strong view of the importance of, of, of thinking this question through a lot more directly than we have to date. It's been, uh, it's been the elephant in the room for a very long time. So the summary that we had out of this was um, you can't have leadership with vision when the donors drive the agenda. Uh, the leadership is always second to the donors. These are not new, new, new findings. I think many of you will have have felt this, but I think it was important to hear it from the researchers themselves. You have to have skilled technical staff, yet uh, ironically, the organizations supporting institutions tend to poach the very best people for their own needs and their own purposes. It's hard to have high quality products when the funding keeps changing direction. Um, and when the donors are making the call, you don't really have governments engaged in the research and in, 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 in the research questions that are being asked. In terms of processes, you have weak institutions, um, you have exploitation by northern partners. So it's very hard to have strong governance and strong management if a lot of the controls are external. And finally, in terms of property, research is underfunded, and I'm going to come back a lot to that towards the end of my, my comments. Um, you have to have the financial resources. They're just, as a donor said, they're, they're distressed, and the research itself is underfunded. At the same time, not everything is negative. Um, there are some efforts, direct efforts underway. In Senegal, the Cité du Savoir is being promoted by the government as a space for research and innovation. Uh, Kigali Innovation City is being developed, um, as you can see in those images of a very, uh, very early stages of development of, again, a space for research and innovation. So there's certainly awareness and there are efforts underway, which is, which is a very, very good sign. When we talked to the researchers, there were really four issues that came up over and over again. And the first issue was that the research agenda is donor managed um, and, the, and the donors have a tendency to change directions. 
uh, when I was at IDRC, we had a saying we used to remind uh, the researchers and the managers by saying old is bad, new is good. And that there's that tendency to keep looking for the great new thing. Uh, there's no persistence. There's even one of the major foundations uh, has as its slogan, impatient optimists. Um, and it's that lack of patience that has been a real challenge for the research organizations and the research institutions. As I said earlier, the good ones are financially distressed. Institution building resources are inadequate. Um, and the organizations don't get to make their own mistakes. Other people are making the call on what they're doing and how they're doing it. And they're getting trained, you know, they're getting, and that's the easy part, teaching somebody how to do a randomized controlled trial or how, how to do really good high quality uh, qualitative research. That's the easy part. Um, but that's not doing, that's training. And the researchers want to be doing and they want to be learning that way, just as that's how we all learn most effectively. And the final one that came up the most was that donors are caught in a project trap. They're concerned about their project, completing their project on time, on budget, and with a good product that they can uh, demonstrate that they've done good work. They're not paying attention to what it takes to really develop a research institution. So what does it mean then to decolonize research? What does it mean that for decisions and the implementation of research to be driven by African research institutions? And what's the role that donors should actually be playing in that? And what's the role that governments and, and the researchers themselves should be playing in that? I think that those are important questions for us to address right now. I'm gonna focus, as I said, on the role of the donors because I think the moment is, is good for that. They are they're struggling. They are thinking about how they're going to deliver their projects. They are thinking about how they're going to work now that they can't travel to, to the institutions they're working with. Um, many donors have brought their staff back to Canada, the US, to Europe. Uh, so how are they going to actually do this? And I think there are some important things that we can uh, contribute and push towards that. And I, would, I wanted to talk about two roles that I think that uh, two areas for donors to really uh, play uh, at this stage. And the first is on institutional priorities, setting the priority on institutions rather than on projects. And the second is around the financing of research institutions. And the first is more uh, conceptual thinking about ideas. The second is more pragmatic. Um, in terms of institutions um, and institutional priorities, the priority really needs to be to be rebalanced from individual capacity strengthening to institutional capacity strengthening. And in that domain, I mean, a number of researchers have tried to, or a number of donors have tried to work effectively in that space by doing institutional strengthening projects. Uh, but they've done it largely through core funding. And what core funding means is that and or, uh, a project like the Think Tank Initiative at IDRC or the BUILD program at the Ford Foundation and many other incarnations of that idea um, puts funds towards the human resources strengthening issues, the IT issues, the financial management, all of the things that everybody recognizes an organization needs to, to run effectively. Uh, and, and that's been a good start. But what it does is it keeps the control of the resources and the timing of the resources in the hands of the donors. In other words, they decide, well, now we're going to do core funding. And then they decide after five, 10, 15 years, we're not going to do it anymore. And suddenly those resources are gone. Those resources disappear. Uh, so the priority is still on the project for the donor. And in the, instead of funding the research, they're funding the institutional strengthening activities but once the donor is gone and the money is gone, there are no resources left uh, to keep those activities functioning effectively. So that's one of the challenges that is faced. And, and the donors do go through cycles. Um, you have cycles where there's a lot of core funding by a lot of different donors. And then at a certain point, they decide it's not working anymore. So they shift and do something else. Um, and then they shift back again after a certain period of time. 
And that really puts the, the research organizations into a really unstable environment. And the second area to look more seriously at is what is the long-term effect of our interventions on institutions? Uh, we don't tend to look beyond the, the final evaluation of projects very often in donor agencies. They, the final evaluation is the, the stamp of approval that this has been well done, it's been well managed, and it has done some good things that should have over the long term some positive and sustainable uh, benefits and effects on the organization. Um, but we don't go much beyond that. Um, Yindra Chakan from Valuing Voices did a study a few years ago in which she uh, concluded that about 99% of donor funding is never looked at five or 10 years down the road. In other words, nobody, nobody goes back after five and 10 years and says, is this institution, is this program, is this field better than it was um, uh, when we started? And was it any better after we left? Has anything stayed or have we simply gone back to where we were before? Um, that just doesn't happen. So we, we actually, even though we've spent billions of dollars, we don't actually know very much about what happened as a result of, the, of, those, uh, of that funding. And I think um, one, of the, um, one of the leaders in thinking about this whole set of issues of strengthening African research institutions is Alex Aze, who was the head of the African Public Health Research Center for a number of years and is now at Drexel University in the US. And he said the model for development funding for the past 50 years has been a humanitarian model. And there are places where a humanitarian model makes very good sense, but in terms of development, it's really the wrong model. And in his view, it has truly failed Africa and it has truly failed the development partners as well in the work that they're doing. So it's really time to be thinking about what do we actually mean by strengthening institutions and, and what can we learn from what has and has not worked in the funding efforts that we've, that we've uh, undertaken to date? That needs a much more serious look by the institutions, uh, the donors themselves. The other uh, area that I wanted to talk a little bit about is um, the financing of research institutions. And when I say to change the lens, um, I come back to the issue that donors think about their research projects and whether or not the research projects are well conducted, um, give some results that can be shared, published. Um, you know, they measure uh, lots of program, research programs get bonuses if they publish in the, in the highest quality journals. Uh, so the lens is really, it's about that research project, making sure that that's a good project and that the researchers are skilled in delivering that project. But if we change the lens and if we think about fi financing research institutions uh, as, as the lens rather than financing research projects, then we have a whole different set of questions we have to ask. We can still fund research, but what is it doing to the people in the organization? What is it doing to the products that we're delivering? What is it doing to the processes they have in place? And how is it helping with the property, with the physical and financial resources they need? So it changes the perspective on what the funding is actually for. That it's not just about the donor research question, it's about the institution and its ability to contribute to its country over time. And I would argue that the 10 to 15% overheads that most uh, donors give are simply inadequate to that new lens. They're adequate to the project lens in the sense that if, um, if you get 15% extra beyond what you uh, figure out your costs are, you, you can manage uh, the unexpected, but only within the context of that project itself. Nothing is left for the research institution to grow and to develop. Nothing is left for developing a good proposal writing function, for developing a good human resources system, uh, for developing a good IT system and so on. So you're really, you're really uh, hamstringing the institutions. And to try to understand what happens in other places, we looked at um, Canadian universities. We use universities because they're much more transparent with their data than a lot of other institutions. 
And in Canadian universities, commissioned research receives 40 to 65% overheads, a much higher rate. And that really allows them to, to have the funding set aside for their HR systems and their proposal management systems and all of those other things, internal research that they can finance for keeping up their own game. Um, it gives them the resources to do those things. Um, that doesn't happen when you have 10 to 15 percent. Um, now, if there are some Canadians online, they would say, well, <clears throat> my financing from the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada or NSERC or other research councils is in that 10 to 15 percent range. True, but the other thing that exists in Canada is the uh, Canada Innovation Fund, whose sole purpose is to provide research infrastructure and maintain that re research infrastructure for the research community. So there are uh, other ways that they're getting that, that, uh, that added resource, ways that African governments are not in a position to, to provide at this point. So a, 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 an overhead rate in a 50 to 60% range would permit the research centers, the resources to grow and develop and become important contributors to national development in their own contexts. Um, and it would achieve that in a way that a core funding cannot because it would become permanent. It would be all research projects over time. And that would just continue and that would give the institutions the, the security of, of resourcing that would allow them to plan long term, think long term. The, res the institutions that didn't use it to do those things would, would fall off the map and stop receiving funding. So I think there would be considerable incentive for, for the researchers and the research organizations to really use the resources effectively. Um, a quote I started with at the beginning, but in a bit more detail from the same researcher. How is Africa ever going to develop if it doesn't have its own set of very strong institutions? And you get strong by doing. Long term, Africa needs these institutions in order to keep moving up. And it is not helping if we're not supporting the development of those institutions. I'm gonna close with the words of uh, some researchers who've been working in development for a long time, who um, promote innovation in everything they do, saying, take risks, accept failure. The work we do is complicated and we can only make progress if we accept that some things will fail spectacularly. So focusing on sustainable development really needs new approaches to strengthening the institutions that we need, it needs experimentation. And if organizations are going to develop the skills and capacities to address the blue marble challenges that we are thinking about here, they need those strong institutions. They need uh, effective institutions in the global south that can uh, fully engage uh, with their northern counterparts and partners. Thank you. Great, thank you, Fred. That was really, really wonderful. And um, I just want to say thank you all to for those of you who are joining. Um, and if you haven't done it already, please put your name and where you're from in the chat box because we have a really global audience here. Um, folks from the Netherlands, um, US, Canada, South Africa, um, Barbados, Brazil, Mexico, Afghanistan, Switzerland, Spain, Kenya, and Zimbabwe. So um, please continue to tell us where you're from because that really helps us with the future. But really what I'd like to do is um, see if you have any questions and if you could put them in the chat box. We do have one, Fred, uh, that I'll, I'll read to you. Uh, how do we provide long-term financial commitments that provides stability to NARS in SSA. Not sure exactly what those acronyms are. Those are uh, National Agricultural Research Systems in Sub-Saharan Africa. Excellent. And shouldn't we consider emerging the CGIAR system with the NARS and offer long-term financial perspectives? Yeah, so I think this is a, a really great example of where the resources are going into an international system rather than international systems. And a lot of the funding and support goes to the consultative group on international agricultural research, which is that big umbrella body with a number of research centers around the world. Um, 
but the national agricultural research systems don't get very enough significant resources. And I would say that, again, here, the, the possibility here is to say, well, instead of funding a project at 15%, fund a project at 50 or 60% overheads so that those institutions know that as long as they're doing good work and getting, getting the work because they're good, they're going to have those added resources that they can use to develop as, as institutions. Um, I don't think it's a, to me, it's not a question of, of, of saying every institution, you know, that each of the NARS should have X, uh, X million dollars per year to function. I think they need to generate that. Um, but if they're generating it with 50 or 60% overheads, then they have resources left to do some of those other things that you need to do to be a good uh, national agricultural research system and provide really strong policy advice to your government. Excellent, excellent. And thank you all for um, continuing to put where you're from. We have folks from Trinidad, Tobago, Ghana, Japan, and Netherlands on the call. Uh, so for the next um, question, this comes from Ian Goldman uh, from South Africa. Coming back to that issue, how do we get the long-term funding and great with that 50 to 60% overhead? So I think it's great supporting your concept of the 50 to 60% Ahead, but how do we how do we get to the long term funding? I think the question is how do we get to the fifty to sixty percent overhead? I think that's the real question, because while it seems to be accepted that Canadian universities should get sixty five percent on commissioned research, somehow it's not accepted that that African universities or research centers should get sixty five percent overhead on their research. I think that's where the real question is, because I I think that. Um, if there is that resource starting to be in place, it's not a temporary resource. It's, you know, it's not like saying, well, with core funding, you've got it for the next 10 years. Uh, it's saying, no, you, you have now a resource that you can use at your discretion as a research center to build up your research center. That's where I think the long-term funding comes from. It comes from building up that core of work and having agreement from, uh, from the donors that they're, spending 60% on their overheads. And that's just the reality of doing the work. Well, in terms of, in terms of that shifting of the mindset, there's a uh, question from Sandra Waddock. How can the mindsets of the funders be shifted so that they adopt the perspectives you are advocating? Yeah, that's a tough one. Uh, but I think the, uh, the global pandemic that we're in right now, horrible as it is, presents a tremendous opportunity because the donors really need to uh, take a hard look at how they're working and what they're, going to, what they're able to accomplish. So I think this is a moment that we can really push ideas like this with donors who are really struggling. Um, you know, the ones I talk to are in meetings all the time looking at these kind of questions and trying to figure out what to do. Uh, so this to me is, is a, a key moment to, to really push that agenda with the donors that you know. Well, perfectly timed, Cassandra, follow that up with, particularly in light of the coronavirus pandemic, it seems that there might be openness to change that did not exist prior to the crisis. What is your sense of the movement potential resulting from the crisis? That's, that's I certainly agree, Sandra. I think that's the critical, uh, critical point that we've got right now is, is an opportunity. Um, I know in talking to a couple of donors that they're, they're really struggling and thinking about it. Uh, they're trying to figure out how they're going to run projects now that they are all uh, stuck in Washington and in New York and Ottawa and Paris and London. Uh, how are they going to actually function? They're thinking about it. So it's the time to you know, get their ear and insert some ideas into that discussion. And this um, is from Ian responding, I think, to your response, saying, uh, but also, how do, we, how do we get not two year, but five year plus funding? So how do we break those short term cycles, uh, short term donor cycles, and really move towards long term thinking and funding? Yeah, I don't know, to be honest. Um, the, the cycle used to be much more around five years, and certainly, IDRC 
we used to laugh about it, but we were serious. And we often had like phase five, phase six, phase seven of a project because we recognized at the time in IDOC that that was what was really needed. Um, and some donors, I mean, I think the Hewlett Foundation, when it initiated the, um, the Think Tank initiative, initiated it thinking on a, on a 10 or 15 year time frame. Um, and that seems to have really shifted to these short, to, uh, 18 months, two year time frames. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, to me, where I would rather put energy is in saying, what can we do to get people to change how they fund the project, whether it's a two year project or a five year project? Um, how did they change their thinking about how they fund it in the first place? So I think, Ian, that's where, that's where, I, would, that's where I would focus. This is from our uh, Blue Marble colleague, Zenda Ophir in Switzerland. Um, you've been doing such important work in this often neglected domain, Fred. Thank you very much for the interesting presentation too. I'm sorry I have to leave, but we'll catch up on some of the challenging issues that appear in evaluations I do for agency funding research in the South. I've made use of your work and look forward to continuing to do so. Uh, Fred, well, this thanks, is Michael. Uh, I'm going to put back in. Okay, go, go ahead. ahead. You want to respond, to Zenda? I do. I just wanted to say thank you, and uh, both Zenda and Ian, you're you're both people who have huge contacts in the donor community, who could be really instrumental in pushing some new thinking at, at that community. Michael, let's. Uh, you've emphasized the opportunity here uh, at this crisis moment. Let's. Let's talk frankly about the shadow side of this because you've lived through that as well. Um, the, the, the support for evaluation units comes and goes and it, evaluation, it strikes me, is especially vulnerable um, at times of economic contraction where resources are diminishing. One of the first things that's easy to cut is uh, evaluation. And we've seen that happen in past crises. Um, you've lived through that both on a resource basis and a political basis where the, the flavor of the day changes. You get leaders that don't value evaluation or don't see its value. And so while there are opportunities, there are also threats. Um, we have folks on here who haven't lived through these crises as, as you and I have. Uh, and, and as you're working these days, how do you explain the value proposition of evaluation for today's time? How would you, uh, an, an institution that's where the evaluation resources, forget five years, the two years is under threat. Um, the very evaluation is under threat. Uh, what's, what's your version of the current value proposition for evaluation? Um, to maintain through the crisis? Yeah, that's a really good question, Michael. Um, to me, the value proposition is the learning dimension rather than the uh, accountability dimension of evaluation. Because it's what, can evalu what value is the evaluation adding to what we know about how to work effectively? I think um, the evaluation has that potential it's too often treated as, as an accountability uh, exercise. That's not interesting, I don't think. And I think for many donors, that's not valuable. Whereas the learning dimension is if you can actually demonstrate learning um, out of the evaluation you're doing that helps the donor or the organization do its work better, then there's much more opportunity to, to, to maintain the function. I think being able to respond, identify and respond to questions the organization has, even if they're not asking the evaluation, evaluators, the evaluators need to be attuned and have their ears to the ground and listening for what are the challenges the, the organization is trying to address and coming up with evidence from the work of that organization and others on things that they could do to address that particular challenge. So being relevant and current, I think is, is crucial uh, much more than having a long-term plan of which, how many evaluations are going to be done each year, but coming up with this always a new issue. Um, one at IDRC was a, a question of, do we support, is it better to just have big projects or, or should we continue to have a lot of small projects? 
what's more expensive and, and how does it cost, cost out? So they were looking at it as solely a financial question. We looked at it as, as a financial question, uh, a time question for the program officers and the opportunity for the organizations that got the small grants as well as the ones that got the large grants. And we're able to give them a much more balanced picture uh, to look at that question. So that's one example so of, I think, a, a way, yeah. Let Go me ahead. follow up and, and, and get your reaction to the practicality uh, of this kind of learning pivot. It, it, it strikes me that, um, and I wrote a blog about this, it's on the Blue Marble website, that every evaluation at every level in every sector, regardless of its original mandate and design, ought to pivot to examine the effects of the pandemic in whatever arena they're operating and to show the utility of evaluation um, to do rapid response and, and to learn. Some of that will need to be collaborating with others, but the fact that an evaluation is not in the health arena doesn't mean that it's not affected by the pandemic. Agriculture is affected, higher education, primary education, um, leadership, economic stuff. And so if evaluators are able to, to pivot and collaborate with people, bringing their resources to bear on learning in the pandemic, um, that means they've got to be agile and, and do that, that quickly. Uh, that would be one way to support the value proposition that I think you've laid out so well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that, that's the big question that everybody has to deal with now in, in everything that they do, whether or not it comes up. Uh, but I know that a lot of organizations are having a hard time with that. I'm on the, I'm a, volunteering with the Canadian Evaluation Society, which um, has its annual conference. It was scheduled for June. Uh, it's been postponed until May of 2021, but they're not thinking uh, yet clearly about, well, what if we can't just do the same 150, 200 person event or 700 person event, but we have to actually pivot and think about a, a totally different way of, of engaging our community. And so our job on, in the evaluation team is to push the, the planners and the managers to think seriously about that question, that it's not just a matter of waiting this out, that there, it's an opportunity and a reality that probably has to be done very differently in the future. So Fred, you, um, a few years ago, you wrote um, very beautifully about process use, and you brought up a story um, when you were at IDRC that the end of project evaluations really weren't happening. And so you decided to sort of retool and rethink um, and, and looking at where learning actually happens in these typically five-year efforts. And you, you learned so much learning happens in the first six months. And then you also, I think, rather brilliantly came up with a, a process of interviewing with different folks at different scales, interviewing at different moments in time that seem to really inject that learning at different scales. Could you comment on that in terms of your reflection on how that's unfolded? And if you've seen that practice sort of further develop over time? Yeah, I don't know how it's developed since I left IDRC about five or six years ago, seven years ago now. Um, but the idea was that there was this thing called project completion reports that were supposed to be done at the end of the project. They're a legal document, so to be deposited with the National Archives. Um, that's something the center had committed. It was a, the center's own idea to do that. They weren't being done. And management just muttered that, you know, program officers weren't doing their job. What we were able to point out to them was that actually the program officers wanted to do them, but the managers weren't actually asking for any of the evidence. And so we just, we sat down and figured out how do we actually make this much more alive and much more real. And one way, as you described, was to think about the fact that there's learning at the beginning of, of, of doing something that gets lost often. There's learning as you go, and there's learning at the end. And the learning at the end is almost the least least important, it's the, it's the early stages of design where a lot of the learning took place. And the interview, what the interview process meant was that instead of a program officer sitting at their desk and writing a long report that nobody would read, uh, 
meant that different people, uh, you know, the program director asked, did one of the interviews with the program officer, the research officer did another one and so on, and another program officer did another one. And then they just recorded those, those interviews. And we were able then in the evaluation unit to use the findings because there was similarity in the questions. We were able to use the findings to talk about the learning that was going on in the organization. Um, across agriculture, health, education, whatever field the, the, the program officer was working in. And that was then a tool to actually have an annual sharing on one or two topics, not everything, but one or two topics. Um, and I think that relates in some senses to, to Michael's point that you have to pivot to what, what's important at the moment. And that was important at the moment because the, the auditor general was saying, hey, you know, you're, not, you're doing pretty well as an organization, but really you say you're gonna do this every year, you know, every project and you're not doing it. So that there was a, an incentive for the organization to figure out what to do about that. And the same is true now of the pandemic. There's a huge incentive for the organizations to figure out what to do. Yeah, beautifully said and, and a wonderful design. Very impressed and I've, I've used that thinking. So this is from Ian Goldman. There's a sort of a two part question. Uh, there is also a challenge when donors lead to expectations which cannot be realized with local funding, for example, per diems, salaries, vehicles. And then, he, then he adds, regarding cost, we also have to promote rapid evaluation and using internal government capacity where possible. That is something I will be exploring in the next few months. This can help to keep evaluation relevant and being used, this can easily be linked with learning with the learning dimension. Yeah, thanks, Ian. That, that's I, I'd love to hear more about that as it as it as it unfolds. Um, yeah, the, the donors. Um, yeah, when the when the control is, if I I missed a, some of the middle of the question because the line went the line cut out, Glenn. But. Um, when the donors are, are making the decisions uh, about what actually gets done, um, they're not doing it with local resources and local talents in mind. Uh, in the research community in the global south and in Africa, there's huge talent. Uh, but a lot of that talent is wasted. A lot of it is ignored. And a lot of it ends up in the African Development Bank, the World Bank, um, other major organizations. And it's not to say people shouldn't have that opportunity, but it's to say that um, too much of that, uh, there's not enough talent to go around at, yet uh, because the talent's not being developed, because the institutions are not being strengthened. Wow. So this is a question from Ray Gonzalez. Um, are allies willing to use their political capital to transform donor funding? And how do we engage allies to do this? Yeah, that's, I think, I think there are allies who want to do this. I mean, I think there are allies, program officers in funding agencies, whether they're bilateral or foundation or multilateral, recognize that the partners they're working with are struggling for reasons of the donors making. A lot of the program staff recognize that. Uh, and I suspect a lot of the managers do too, but they're less willing to talk about it. So there are allies, I think, in most organizations. And certainly whenever I talk to uh, people in donor organizations about this issue, they, they recognize it, they acknowledge it, they agree with it. Uh, whether or not they do anything about it is a different thing. Uh, but I think we're in a moment now where we can start to really push because it's totally relevant to addressing how we work following, uh, following this massive shift that we're going through. Yeah, yeah, beautifully said. This is from Enoch Makobi. Um, and what are your thoughts about blockchain technology being used to reduce overhead costs that are used to compensate for every, for every actors and third parties in the donation process, which disincentivizes potential donors as well as the lack of data transparency, both in terms of how money gets to destinations and in terms of how it is used and beneficial for the intended cause. Bearing in mind blockchain reduces the number of middlemen and offers real-time 
accurate and traceable data. Yeah, I don't know a lot about blockchain, I have to say. Um, what I've learned about it is that it certainly has some potential and it has some risks, but I, I just don't know enough to really comment on the role of, of blockchain. I, I mean, transparency, I think, is a critical thing. I think we need to be moving to a lot more transparency than we have now in, in the development community. It's very hard to actually find out what's going on and who's doing what. Um, so I think there needs to be more transparency. And if that can help transparency, great. And if it can't, then I think it, it should be avoided. But uh, that, that's as much as I can say on, on the subject. Sorry. So Fred, one of the questions um, you mentioned in terms of capacity development, um, particularly in Africa, um, there is, as you well know, there's the evolution of the Eval Youth Program um, globally and a really wonderful expression in both Latin America and in Africa. Uh, your thoughts on ways to connect Eval Youth to these issues and to um, to create a bridge around understanding institutional effectiveness, et cetera, learning and um, weaving with their priorities and competency development. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's hugely important to talk with them on the subject, to engage them in efforts that are looking at institutional strengthening. They're a, a powerful force potentially to really start to shift the thinking. They have the ideas, they have the energy, uh, they, they can learn lots of things from experienced evaluators and bring huge new opportunities themselves. So I think bringing more, uh, more eval youth into programs and into projects, setting up conversations on the subject, saying, you know, why is this an important part of evaluation? Um, and having those conversations with them, I'm sure they would come up with with ideas and uh, approaches that I would never dream of. Mm. And also, just regarding the institutional capacity development, how um, what would you say is a sort of an exemplar of the adaptive learning um, outside of the African context, in other contexts? Where would you say there are models where this is being done well, where the um, with the institutional strengthening is something that we could look at and try to understand better, perhaps as a blue marble case example. Well, I think one in Africa is the African Public Health Research Center. Uh, and the reason I say that is, is that it, it was set up through a grant from a foundation and it was given initially a 10 year funding window. Then the staffing in the foundation changed. And after, I think it was three years, they were told your grant will end in, in, at the, in the next, end of the next quarter. And they happened to have a very skilled and energetic group of researchers who said, are we just gonna accept this and close down or we're we gonna do something about it? And they decided to do something about it. And so they started writing research proposals. Um, I think, if I recall correctly, they wrote something like 18 proposals in that three month period for research projects and got 17 of them funded. And uh, so from that point on, they were on their way. They had projects, they had resources that they could actually continue. So that's an example of an institution that adapted to a massive uh, change rather than being crushed by that change and has continued to function effectively and continued to be uh, well-respected and well-regarded for the quality of its research. Mm. Has that been written up or do you think there's any um, plan for that case to be written up? Could it be written up? It could be written up. I don't think, it, I don't know that it has been. It, I, I haven't actually checked. I've, I just talked to the director. <laughs> so I don't know if it's been written up. Yeah, that'd be good, that'd be good to think about. Um, and this is also for everyone involved, the more, uh, if you think you have case studies, we have sites, uh, we have an area on the website for suggestions for case study development, which would be really okay. useful. Yeah. Um, so, um, Fred, I just want to also say, um, Ian Goldman did respond to your comments and said, Fred, we have, um, have you written up that interview approach? Great example. And, and I think that reflects back to the process use for New Directions um, Journey. Yeah, Ian, that's, well, that was in New Directions in, ooh, 
I don't remember what year. I can I can certainly send you the, the reference, Ian, um, to that article. Yeah, I think that was winter 2007, number 116 of New Directions. Sounds about right. Um, excellent. Well, let me just, um, before I turn it back to Michael, um, Fred, any final thoughts, comments? No, so, um, I appreciate the questions. Um, and I really do think this is a moment to push any contacts you have, any sympathizers that you have to be thinking a lot more seriously about how research gets financed in, in the global south and even how any projects get financed in the global south so that we can create a much more even playing field than we have. Yeah, excellent. So just want to also give a promotion for the next Blue Marble webinar. Uh, we're actually going to stay in the global south. We're going to have a focus on um, Ghana, and we're going to look at small scale fisheries and the potential for the application of Blue Marble evaluation to uh, very regionally focused small scale fisheries. This is will be uh, joined by um, Kofi Agoba from Yen Mpwano, which is a small scale fisheries organization in Ghana. Uh, but we'll be also, um, I think also joined by Alistair Harris of Blue Ventures talking about global issues in small scale fisheries. So join us, that'll be on May 20th. That's uh, 10 a.m. Eastern, which is 1600 uh, CET, um, and just keep an eye on the Blue Marble website for that information. So, Michael, let's turn it over to you to uh, close us out. Thank you, Glenn, and thank you, Fred. Tremendous presentation, great interaction around the questions. This webinar, as all of them, is recorded and will be on the Blue Marble website as our blog posts. And we are also engaged in a book club examining chapter by chapter the Blue Marble Evaluation book. Uh, the next Blue Marble Evaluation discussion is on April 27, uh, chapter four we're up to, uh, the integration principle. And so you uh, have to uh, register the, on the website, become a, uh, a, an affiliate to the website through registration. There's no cost or, or anything else. It just makes sure that you get the announcements and then you can join the book club if you're interested in discussing with other people, reading and thinking about each of the principles. So April 27 will be the next Blue Marble Evaluation book club session on chapter four. Thank you, Fred. All of you stay safe, stay well, stay strong, um, and keep supporting each other in this community. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. And I'm just going to be in these challenging times. I like to close these webinars with a gigantic group hug because uh, with social distancing, we cannot get the vitamin H that we need. So if everyone just extends their arms and just brings this global community together, a little bit of vitamin H across the globe. So thank you all very much. Stay safe. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Peace.